And uh, I also like to uh, take a couple of minutes uh, to recognize uh, the lovely staff that's actually here helping us and, and making sure that this uh, uh, flows uh, smoothly. So thank you very much to all the lovely staff. Uh, that same staff um, is, is going to have the ability uh, over time uh, to keep us connected. And my intent is that um, if you are interested and willing to provide your information, uh, we approach you uh, for some of the clinical trials that we will be bringing to the area. Uh, but also if you're interested in, in contacting any of the members of this panel or myself, uh, we are very happy uh, to do so and have interactions with you. Matter of fact, uh, four or five years ago, uh, part of our panel uh, and I at the Brigham uh, instituted a consultative service that we do remotely. And we've consulted from other continents and obviously from the U.S. and we have the ability to do, the, do so formally. Uh, and so this is a resource that exists. Unfortunately, it's a paid resource and some insurance companies cover it or not. Uh, but we are, as, as, as providers, we're more than happy uh, to waive our fees. There's a low administrative fee that's required uh, if you do decide, uh, or your physician does decide to use this resource. And, and again, this is something that we'll have available to all of you um, uh, if you're interested in getting a quote-unquote second opinion regarding your disease. But more important than that, I really want to leave the message uh, that we have. We're going, we, our goal is to have a permanent presence uh, in Albuquerque and in New Mexico, uh, and if successful, and I, don't, I have no reason to believe we're not going to be successful just based on the turnout today, uh, we're going to be able to rapidly provide you with opportunities to participate in clinical research and further our knowledge of the disease. And so, again, I stress upon this partnership that we'll develop. There's a, a brief form uh, that's being uh, offered uh, in the tables to participants. Uh, if you're a patient or if you have a loved one who has this disease, uh, and it doesn't have to be IPF, but we mostly focus on pulmonary fibrosis, I encourage you to provide your information. Um, we've been in the business for more than a couple of decades and we know the importance of the privacy of information. And we're not going to be sharing this information with anybody that is not a part of our group. Uh, and we will not use your information in any inappropriate way. What we really want to do is within the next couple of months, uh, contact all of you directly and uh, uh, inquire regarding your willingness to participate in registries and to participate in clinical trials and of course we'll be very respectful of any decision you make regarding that participation. This is obviously all very volunteer. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's an all-volunteer participation basis. To that extent, uh, one of the things that we were thinking about when we um, decided to put this forum together is that physicians uh, have this propensity to using complicated terms and really not be able to um, reach uh, patients and their families because of the very complicated jargon that they've acquired over the years. And, and I consider myself guilty of that uh, to a large extent. And, and my experience over the years has been that um, healthcare allies and, and folks involved in research actually have a better grasp of how communicating with patients because they use late terms uh, and at the same time, they're in that frontier of actually interaction with the research and medical staff. And so a good example of this is Betsy Peters. Betsy is the director of our clinical research program at the Brigham. Um, basically, uh, our clinical research operation, and this is sometimes, sometimes something that I constantly remind her, would not uh, work without her. And uh, Betsy has a tremendous amount of experience conducting clinical research trials, uh, deals with patients on a daily basis and directly, and therefore is very knowledgeable about concerns that patients have regarding clinical trials. Are these being ethically conducted? Are the purpose of these trials to benefit pharmaceutical companies or to benefit me? Who is responsible for what happens to me when I participate in a clinical trial? What should I expect when I come to a hospital to participate in a clinical trial? And on and on and on. There are many, many questions, all of them legitimate, that I think is important to address. And again, we don't really provide a forum for this in the clinic. Uh, we certainly don't provide a forum for this on the internet. And so I thought this was a very important talk. Uh, and therefore the title, Demystifying Clinical Trials of Pulmonary Fibrosis. I encourage you all to interrupt Betsy as much as you want. Uh, this is really intended to be a very interactive session. We want your feedback. We want your questions. 
we want you to challenge this participation in clinical trials. And so uh, I, I welcome Betsy uh, to give her a very interesting talk on clinical trials and IPF. Thanks, Betsy. So thank you. Um, so as uh, Dr. Rose said, I will be talking about um, clinical trials, uh, the basic ele elements of clinical trials, and then frequently asked questions. So first, what is clinical research? Uh, clinical research involves human volunteers to answer specific questions to better find ways to prevent, detect, or treat illnesses. Um, a couple examples of uh, clinical research are tissue banks and um, clinical trials. So tissue banks are research projects where they'll ask for you to donate a blood sample or another tissue sample, like a biopsy, if you have a tissue biopsy and have leftover sample, they may ask to collect that and store in a <coughs> tissue bank along with some information with, um, about your health from your medical records. Um, and then they'll use these um, tissue samples and other uh, researchers can request them for uh, research in IPF. Uh, clinical trials are to investigate the dosage, safety, and effectiveness of experimental drugs. And um, this has been said before in, in, in other talks that before uh, drugs are tested in humans, they go through a long process that includes preliminary, uh, preliminary laboratory research and animal testing. So there are four phases of clinical trials. Um, phase one is a new treatment is tested in a small number of people for the first time to determine safety. And this is typically t uh, tested in human volunteers first. And then a phase two trial continues to test the safety in a larger group of people while also testing um, effectiveness of the drug. Phase three is when a new drug is given to a large group of people to confirm its effectiveness and um, compare it to the standard treatment. And a lot of the information uh, collected during a phase three trial will be then uh, given to the FDA to allow it to be um, approved for marketing. And then phase four trials are done after the drug has gone to market and a test for long-term effects and also safety as well. So why participate in a clinical trial? So it's completely voluntary and it's everyone's own personal decision to uh, decide to join a clinical trial. Um, but <clears throat> some of the benefits of clinical trials can be that you can play a more active role in your own healthcare, that you can gain access to new research treatments before they are widely available. You receive regular and careful monitoring of your condition um, and you can help others by contributing to medical research. A lot of times when patients um, are, see, are seen in a clinical trial, they develop a relationship with their study doctors, experts in the field, um, as well as having their relationship with their primary doctor. So just you have more exposure to, um, to the medical team. Will you qualify to participate in an IPF clinical trial? So all studies have eligibility criteria. And um, these are guidelines determined by the study um, that patients must meet in order to qualify for the study. And they, all, they differ according to the study, but often include age, medical history, <coughs> and current health status. Um, the eligibility criteria are designed to protect patient safety. So exa for example, um, a patient who has another health condition may not qualify for a study because that condition may put them at risk for developing complications due to taking an experimental medication. So for the safety of the patient, they may not be enrolled in the clinical trial. Um, eligibility criteria also um, help researchers achieve accurate and meaningful results. So what can you expect when you're recruited to a clinical trial? Well, first, before you um, do any study or procedures, you'll have what's called an informed consent process. And that's when you and your doctor will sit, uh, the study doctor will sit down and go over all elements of the study, everything that's going to be done. And um, the study doctor will explain the purpose, the all the procedures, uh, the risks and the benefits, and your participant rights. And your participant rights are that you understand that it's a voluntary, um, that the study is voluntary, and that if you do decide to enroll, you can withdraw at any time without, any, without jeopardizing any future medical care. 
<clears throat> it's also a time for you to ask all the questions before deciding to enroll. Um, and then once you've had this conversation, um, you both sign the study consent and um, a, a screening visit will be scheduled. And <laughs> the informed consent process is ongoing, so no, after you've signed, if there's any new information that comes up, your doctor will explain any new risks or benefits to you, and you're welcome to ask questions throughout the, the clinical trial. Um, so the screening visit is a, a study visit where they do comprehensive testing to make sure that you qualify and you meet the eligibility criteria. And most commonly in IPF trials, they'll have blood tests, history and physical exam, pulmonary function testing or breathing tests, six minute walk test, um, a chest CT or x-ray, and sometimes an EKG. So also many of the IPF um, studies are double-blind placebo controlled trials. And um, placebos are medications that are made to look like the medication, but it doesn't contain any of the actual ingredient um, in the medication. And then double-blinded means that neither you nor your doctor knows um, whether or not you're getting the actual drug or the placebo. And the reason why these kind of trials are important is to determine if the side effects or, um, or improvements are actually due to the treatment and not some other factor. There's a phenomenon called the placebo effect where if patients believe what they're taking, um, if they believe it's, it's working, then they perceive their, their, um, their condition to be improving. So by having the comparison groups, they can rule out some of those um, biases. So once you're, uh, you meet the eligibility criteria and you're enrolled in the trial, you'll be assigned to um, one of two groups if it's a placebo-controlled um, study. And um, this is done by chance, like a flip of a coin. And so you'll be assigned to either the placebo group or the treatment group, and we call this um, randomization. And then after you start taking the, the how do I go back? After you start uh, taking the study medication, they'll want you to come back to the study center um, for study visits. And the purpose of these are to monitor your safety and to test the effectiveness um, of the study treatment. And some of the procedures that they'll do at the study visits um, in IPF trials are uh, blood, uh, blood draws to um, test the safety of the drug in your system, um, pulmonary function testing uh, to follow your lung function, They'll ask you about any side effects or new medications that you may have started while on the, <coughs> the trial. Um, you may be asked to answer questionnaires or given drug diaries, which are pamphlets where, where you'll keep track of the study medication and the times that you're taking it, and also some information about any side effects you can write down in the, the drug diaries. So how are patient rights protected? Well, the informed consent is very important um, to protect your rights because you'll receive all the information um, that's, that you'll be, uh, that, that the trial will cover. Um, it's also a time for you to ask questions to the, um, to the study doctor if you have any. Um, all studies will go through a scientific review where they'll, um, they'll look at the study for the, <coughs> the, sci uh, the, the scientific soundness of it. So. Um, to make sure the study design is, is sound. Um, and then no one's enrolled in a clinical trial before an IRB looks at the protocol. So it's an institutional review board. And their main role is to look at patient safety, um, to make sure the trial is ethical and that the procedures being done. <laughs> <Oops. laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, so the IRB will make sure that the, um, patient safety is protected, um, and they, they'll even uh, ask you to make changes in your research if they, they see anything um, that they're concerned about. And then all trials will have uh, some kind of monitoring board. Um, a data safety monitoring board is a group of people that are independent from the, the people who are running the study. And their role is to 
look at the ongoing data being collected with the study to look for any safety concerns that come up. And they have the um, ability to stop a trial if they see anything concerning um, while they're getting the regular, um, regular reports from what's going on in the trial throughout the study. <coughs> Will you know if the treatment worked and when? So the study team will typically share your test results with you and your doctor with your permission. Um, they may not have access to test results that would indicate which study group you're in, which would unblind them and you. Um, but more like PFTs or breathing tests and regular, lab, um, regular labs will typically be made um, available to you if you request them. Um, most studies will be able to share your study group assignment at the end of the study um, once uh, the, the results have been published. And um, new information learned in the study will be published in medical journals. However, they'll never identify you personally. So you can always, that's a good question to ask um, your doctor is if you'll know which study group you're in after you participate. Um, so here are some more questions you might want to ask when you're considering a, a clinical trial. Um, what is the purpose of the research? Why do researchers think the approach may be effective? Who will be in charge of um, your care? What are the potential risks of the study? What happens if I'm injured as a result of participating in a study? How long will my participating, participation in the study last and how often will I have to come in for study visits? And can you get the treatment once the trial is completed? <coughs> uh, some of the barriers to recruitment in clinical trials are that patients may not know about the clinical trials, they may not have access to the trials, or they may be afraid or suspicious of, um, of research. <coughs> so I'm gonna go over some common myths in, in um, clinical trials and try to clarify them. So clinical trials seem dangerous or unsafe, and um, there, there is risk involved in clinical trials, which you'll go over in the informed consent um, process. But um, new medications in the process of FDA approval may only be tested on humans after extensive laboratory testing provides valid evidence that the treatment or device appears to be safe and effective. So drugs, um, as it's been mentioned before, will go through several years of testing before they'll make it into human trials. Um, and this is uh, through laboratory testing and animal testing. Um, and then trials are monitored by committees not involved in the trial to ensure the safety of participants. And some patients may feel that they will be treated like a guinea pig. And um, physicians caring for patients in the context of a clinical trial um, treat these patients as they would any other patient and most research patients describe their experience with research as positive. Um, clinical trials are too expensive. Well, most um, clinical trials don't involve your insurance company, and the study sponsor or the pharmaceutical company um, will pay for all costs related to research that is not part of your regular medical care. Um, Another thing they may, they may provide reimbursement for travel costs such as parking, mileage, um, sometimes hotels and, and flights. And you just need to talk to your study doctor or coordinator to find out the details about, you know, to make sure that, you know, your insurance or you aren't, will not be responsible for the, the testing they'll be doing for research or if they provide any um, reimbursement for travel. So um, the pulmonary foundation, uh, pulmonary fibrosis foundation, is a really good resource for IPF patients. It's a nonprofit organization that um, connects patients and their families with resources in IPF, and also um, they have some information about current clinical trials going on. So I just I put up a screenshot here just to show you how you can find out where the clinical trials are. So the uh, website is in your program, so you can refer to that if you want to if you want to get onto this website. But up at the top, um, there's a tab that says patient resources. And so if you click on that tab, it'll bring you to the next page, which I have. And then in the left-hand panel, it says um, current clinical trials. <coughs> if you click on that, you'll get to this listing of current clinical trials that are accepting IPF patients. Um, 
And they get this information from uh, clinicaltrials.gov, which is also in your program. And that's a comprehensive listing of all of the clinical trials being done. Um, the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation, though, pulls out the, I the ones being done in IPF and the ones that are open to enrollment. So they're taking patients currently. Um, if you click on in the individual um, trials, you'll get information about where that trial is being done, the eligibility criteria, and just some more information on you know, how, what participating in that clinical trial would be like. So um, I wanted to go over patient rights and research. Um, I kind of touched on this a little bit before, but I just um, put it up here just to re-emphasize. Um, so, you have the right to information about why the research study is being done, what will happen during the research study, the risks, the side effects, and discomforts from taking part in the study, the possible benefits from taking part in the study, other treatment choices and their risks and benefits, medical treatment in case of complications, and you also have the right to decide not to take part in a study or to decide to drop out at any at any time, and this will not affect your right to the usual care um, not related to the study. Um, you can decide whether to take part without any pressure, um, ask questions at any time, and you should receive a copy of the consent form to reference once you've signed it. And these all should be covered in the informed consent process. So why is clinical research so important? Well, <clears throat> clinical research is so important because we won't find a we won't find a treatment for IVF without it, and we can't do clinical research without patients who are willing to participate. So, the more people that participate in clinical trials, the faster we can answer the critical research questions that will lead us to a better treatment options for IVF. Are there any questions? You need to be uh, associated with Loveless Care Plan to. Um, no, no, you don't, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the last presentation. I'm sorry? You do not need to be part of the Loveless Health okay, Plan. Is there a common theme to a lot of these trials in terms of what the drugs are attempting to do? Are they attempting to reverse? Are they attempting to slow down? Are they attempting to remove? So, um, Dr. Rose might be able to address that, but they, a lot of them are getting uh, involved in the pathway of fibrosis to try to stop that, but you could talk more scientifically about it. Um, that's a great question. Um, and and I, can, I can spend some time answering it, but, but I think the take-home message here is that um, all treatments right now have the goal of trying to decrease the progression of the disease. So the ultimate goal is to have something that would revert the disease. But since we're being very transparent, very honest in this discussion, there's nothing in 10 years or 20 years of research that actually has come close to that. So we'd be happy enough to see something that would control the progression of the disease. Now, where pharmaceutical companies and scientists are coming from is that we think there are, as Dr. Al Shamali described, multiple mechanisms that are involved in the development of the disease. And from a strategic standpoint, pharmaceutical companies are trying to target individual components of the disease to see if they can actually demonstrate that by addressing that component, by inhibiting that specific pathway, uh, the disease progression can be controlled. But as Dr. Al-Shamali mentioned as well, what we envision is because this is a complex disorder in which multiple pathways are involved, that there will be a layered or multi-pronged approach to actually treating the disease. Pharmaceutical companies are not interested in competing with themselves. They don't want to actually put out the same product, although that happens. That's really not the goal. And so what you will find is most pharmaceutical companies are trying to identify the quote-unquote most novel approach, most novel compound, to treat the disease. And so for the most part, you won't see pharmaceutical companies trying to target uh, the same molecule of pathway, although uh, there are some common themes to these uh, trials. I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? Are um, stem cell research being done with IPA? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so the question is, is stem cell research being conducted in pulmonary fibrosis? Um, this is a very exciting um, area in science, technology, and medicine. Uh, stem cells are uh, so-called progenitor cells. Uh, there are cells that are thought to have the capability of um, differentiating themselves into different cell types. And so they're supposed to be the mother cell that's able to um, provide other types of cells. This actually would be a very interesting approach to this issue of remodeling. Right? If you have a number of cells within the lung that are affected, which is what we think happens with IPF, and you have a so-called mother cell that could replace the abnormal other cells, that actually would be a very, very interesting proposition. So this has been tested in the mouse. And these mother cells can actually come from the bone marrow, they can come from the organ itself, or they can come from exogenous sources. And those are all experiments have been done. And the preliminary data, surprisingly enough, suggests that IPF is one of the best targets for this type of therapy. So there's some very exciting uh, data right now in cardiovascular disease, suggesting that if you take a small part of the heart during the bypass procedure, and you actually culture these so-called stem cells, and you expand them in the dish, and then you re-inject them into individuals with a cardiac catheterization procedure, there seems to be improvement in the contractility of the heart by clinical tests. This is extremely exciting, and it's happening as we're speaking right now in the country. So one could envision that within the next decade, there will be clinical trials in which stem cells will be used to try to do remodeling in the lung and try to effectively replace the cells that are affected. There's a call for proposals from the Alliance for Scientists to actually do this. There are large funded trials doing preclinical studies in primates, trying to demonstrate that this is feasible. And there are some private sources that right now are funding in real time uh, stem cell research. And Dr. Shamali and I know actually one of the investigators who's uh, successfully applied for an IND uh, and is in the process of designing some of these trials. So the answer is yes. Uh, stem cells hold promise for many disorders, including IPF, and I would expect that in the next uh, decade we'll have some data suggesting if they're effective or not. Uh, yes, sir. Are, is there any coordination between stem cell research in the United States and in uh, the European Union and um, Asia, for example, in Japan, China, etc.? Uh, specifically to stem cell research. Well, um, you know, the scientific community, for good or bad, or we're all pals, uh, and we're all trying to deal with the same problem. So what we do is, uh, at an academic level, we have standards for publication, uh, which means that, that there are ethical uh, uh, design um, and scientific relevant questions that we all want to publish in very reputable journals, because that's how we get recognized as scientists. And that may seem not related to the question that you're asking, but this is actually the most effective and reproducible way of interacting with science. Some numbers quote that 95% of the science that's published is not reproducible, which means that 95% of the conclusions that we make are false. And so having very uh, st uh, strict uh, uh, scientific standards in how we go about doing our research is the basis of who we are as scientists. And uh, again, uh, peer publication is the most effective and most uh, um, reasonable way of communicating findings. But we also like to hang out in nice places. So for example, this year, we'll go to San Diego and uh, 15,000 pulmonologists will hang out and talk about different scientific issues. And the same goes for multiple areas of research. Those interactions exist. Uh, one of the reasons why um, the world is better is because we compete. And so these scientific teams also compete in the stem cell area in particular, however, uh, because of a lot of ethical concerns, there's some differences regarding the approaches that Europe and the U.S. have. As you know, we all have uh, concerns regarding our religious beliefs and how we actually use these for research, and stem cells are an area in which this has uh, a lot of implications, uh, and we have differences with actually Europe and other continents. Uh, so the NIH does not fund um, um, true stem cell research, uh, which has been a matter of a lot of controversy. Uh, and that's an important difference between some of the European and Asian groups in which there's no restriction on such type of research. Uh, but for the most part, we're all, again, as I said, 
Uh, we're all invested in the same cause. We all have the same goals. Uh, and I think that the way science is structured and the way peer review contributes to how we um, determine if science is good or not, it's probably the most effective way of bringing this to patients. Because if we didn't have actual very strict guidelines and control on how we may go about doing this data, there'd be a lot of personal interest that will be translated in the scientific findings, which would not be a benefit to patients. I'm curious if there's been any work done on redox signaling molecules in a nebulizer. Is Jake here? <laughs> okay, uh, yes. <laughs> so, can I simplify the question? <laughs> Because uh, the, the, the way you stated it may be a little bit complicated for the audience. So, so there, there's uh, um, innate or inherent uh, defense mechanisms uh, that cells and organs have uh, to attack injury. And as we talked about at the beginning of our session, uh, we think that there's ongoing repetitive injury that occurs in uh, IPF. And um, cells communicate with the outside uh, and the inside of the cell or with other cells through a process called signaling. It's kind of the messages that are passing the different compartments of the cell. Um, and one of the uh, injuries uh, that are most relevant to survival of cells uh, has to do with the um, production or the uh, barren production of oxygen radicals. And so there's a very fine-tuned system that tries to control the um, oxidative levels in tissues and cells and organs, and to some extent that actually contributes to the development of disease. So with that said, redox signaling is one of the critical components of what we call homeostasis, of cells being able to survive. And there's extensive research in multiple areas of medicine in which actually redox signaling is thought to play a significant role. Broccoli, believe it or not, is one of the most potent uh, um, um, mechanisms, I'm sorry, one of the mo most uh, potent natural uh, products that actually uh, modulates redox signaling. Um, there's a whole NIH grant, large NIH grant, we call those program project grants, looking at how broccoli can affect a critical signaling pathway, if you will, if you will they call the NRF2 pathway. Uh, and there are some very promising um, findings there suggesting that if we eat a lot of broccoli, maybe we can actually affect uh, lung disease. But yes, NAC, which is the other molecule that we talked about, also is supposed to modulate the oxidative stress environment in the lung. And so I expect that over the, over the um, next decades, we'll learn more and more about how aging actually affects this redox signaling uh, and why it's important as we age to try to help the body uh, try to preserve these protective mechanisms. So the answer to the question is, yeah, this is an area of, of tremendous interest, not only in lung disease, but diseases throughout uh, the spectrum. When you were talking about uh, the life cycle of a research study, you said um, from enrollment, and then at the end, after it's over, you could, the patient would find out their personal allocation to which pool and, and results and whether they could, could continue with medication. Um, what's the typical life cycle of a successful study? How, how long from the beginning to when the end is clear? So um, once the last person enrolled uh, completes the trial, it usually takes another four to five um, months to lock the, the data and do the analysis and then a year from there to have the study published. But um, if you ask the uh, study group uh, up front, they can probably give you more information on that, depending on what the study sponsor, whoever's um, sponsoring the, the trial, can give you more specific information. Another, another way to look at the same question is, has to do with what Dr. Shimali mentioned during his presentation. Is it, if you really take the bird's eye view of how long it takes from the um, development of a concept and its actual successful implementation and, and, and clinical practice is somewhere um, around 10 years and probably requires uh, a billion uh, in investment uh, from the um, government, from the pharmaceutical industry, and the community. There's a tremendous amount of effort involved in getting one of these trials to actually happen. And one way of quantifying is how much a pharmaceutical company needs to 
make in order to break even, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. The amount of knowledge that's been funded by the government to actually get there is, is probably not readily measured. I think the other side of that question that you're asking is um, the patient's perspective. Like, okay, that's good for me to know that these are the dynamics and the economics of research, but how does that affect me? When will I know if I get enrolled in clinical trial? When will I know the result? And the truth is that unless the trial is successful and stopped because of success, you won't know immediately. And I don't expect any of the trials that we have on the dock right now that we expect to bring to New Mexico 2014 to give us any groundbreaking results in which you would immediately know the results. However, I do expect that once the database is locked, once all the data is collected, uh, and the investigators can start to do analysis, you can expect anywhere between 6 to 24 months for the data to actually make publication. And this is important because of what I just mentioned. So investigators are very biased. If I've spent the last 10 years studying a molecule, and I've actually spent the last 10 years studying a molecule, and I'm actually putting that molecule into a clinical trial, what do you think my biases would be about that molecule? What do you think my advice would be to all of them? Right? Get into my trial. This is fantastic. I spent my life researching it, and I think I've got the best thing since sliced bread. It's a huge bias. And so I need independent jurors to look at the validity of my data, the design of my study, and how I'm actually going to bring this to patients in order to be balanced, in order to be fair, in order to actually determine if this is an effective therapy. And that's what peer review is. And peer review exists in many forms, but the one that I think is most relevant to this discussion is that I need somebody to look at my research paper and say, you know what, I agree with your findings. Or, you know what, you're in love with your molecule and what you're saying is not true. <laughs> right? And so I think that takes, that takes some time. So uh, publishing a paper, depending on what the paper is, uh, can also take a couple of years. But, but look, I, I think that we, we shouldn't be cynical. Uh, there is a clear need for therapies in IPF. And I can almost guarantee you that if a data safety monitoring board had to stop a trial because we see a positive effect of the medication, that would happen. I just don't expect it because of the high variability of the disease in patients with IPF, in which statistical power is fundamental. And I actually wasn't here when you, you probably mentioned the placebo, but this is why placebo arms are necessary. There is such variability in the response to a medication from a patient, a group of patients from IPF, that you would never be able to tell if a medication is effective. And we have 50 years of failure trying to do non-randomized trials in, in pulmonary fibrosis to be able to demonstrate that something works or not, and it never worked. It was only when we did a double-blinded, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, which is what Dr. Alshimali mentioned, that we found out that giving immune suppression to IPF patients is not effective. So part of the reason why we wanted to do this session and part of the reason why we were asking you to spend this time with us is that we need to educate you as to what the limitations of this trial design are and how that has an impact on you. I, I can't tell you how many times I sit in front of an individual and I tell them you should participate in the clinical trial and the individual answers, oh, yeah, of course I want to participate, but I want the drug. I don't want the placebo. Is that, I'm with you. <laughs> if, I was in your, if, I, if I was in your position, I would want the same thing. But I think that as a participant in the trial, you also want the truth. You want to know if what you're taking is really a medication that's going to help you long term or not. So to the question that the gentleman asked uh, earlier in the session regarding taking medications or taking certain treatments that actually could break down this fibrosis that we're talking about, why not just go and get the real deal? Why not actually go and get this thing that I think is going to help me? I, you know, I've read a lot. I know what this is all about. And I actually want to take something that I think is going to help me now. I don't want to have to wait a couple of years. And certainly, although I love mankind, I don't think that it is my role to actually provide the information that's needed to determine which is the medication. So I, I get it. I understand why people feel this way. But I also understand, because of my training, that the only way to truthfully answer the question is to design a trial that allows us to determine if it's effective or not, and there's no other design than the randomized trial to do so. So I think that the trials are short-lived, they're one year. Uh, if we're talking about average survivals of three to five years, there's still an opportunity. If we all get out there and we all do a concerted effort to participate, that in time we will maybe be able to have an effective therapy that helps us and others. It may not be, maybe that some people who are actually participating in the clinical trial will end up transplanted, like many of my patients. 
But I think it's the spirit of what we're doing, which is what I want you to understand. And certainly I'm not here, or we're not here, to actually uh, um, um, convince anybody about doing it. I just want to give you the information to understand why we go about doing things the way we do.